Welcome to uh, Biosurface's second webinar. Today we're going to be talking about, uh, about a lot to do with the cell therapy space and just devices as well as just an overview of uh, from where our presenters think the cell therapy space is going to be going. Our title today is Unlocking Potential Cell Therapy's Impact on the Future. Our three presenters today going in order from when they're presenting. The first presenter will be Dr. Vincent Lang, uh, who is the head of search and evaluation for drug delivery technologies at Takeda. Vincent seeks out novel drug enabling technologies that can result in new therapeutic modalities for treating challenging diseases. Vincent will be discussing his expertise in the cell therapy field as well as what he believes the industry is moving towards. Uh, our second presenter will be Ran Hadroj. Ran is the Director of Device Development at Biosurfaces and will be presenting her work on the Biospun Cell Chamber and how she believes this technology could have a significant impact in the cell therapy space. Our third and final presenter is Dr. Massimiliano Paganelli, sorry for butchering that, uh, also by Max. He's the co-founder of Morphocell Technologies Incorporated, a regenerative medicine a company aiming at revolutionizing the treatment of liver disease by the means of cell therapy and tissue engineering. Max will be presenting data related to morphocell stem, th stem cell therapy derived tissues for liver replacement therapy. So those are the diverse topics we have today and uh, I look forward to hearing their presentations as well. Uh, so why don't we get started? Uh, our first presenter is uh, Vincent Link. So Vincent, if you want to share screens, let me unshare so you can share. Yeah, sure. Great. All right, here we go. And everybody see this there. Can we see this? Yep. All right. OK, so let's talk about cell therapies, right? Um, it's really funny because a lot of people, when they think of cell therapies, it's just one thing. But actually, it's it's more complex than that, because you have to remember, at the end of the day, you're trying to solve a or try to help cure or solve uh, some disease state. So cell therapies don't exist out there like, you know, in somewhere in outer space. It's actually an applied technology that you have to take into consideration what disease you're trying to address. Now, these are just some sample diseases here on this side, like oncology, GI, and neurosciences. And, and in a case like this, if you have a drug on one side, different ways to treat diseases, you can have small molecules, nucleic acids, biologics, and then we have you know things that are really big, like cells and viruses. Now, it turns out for the smaller you know, uh, molecules, you can put them into particles and encapsulate and deliver them with energy, a lot of cool things. But once you get to something the size of cells, and you use these for like regenerative medicine or transplants or cell therapy, like in immunological therapies, they get too large, right? And as a result, when you deliver them, unless you're trying to deliver them systemically, you have to put them in something. You're not going to be putting inside a particle, you're not going to be blasting them. And so you know, what you probably would need to do is you have to put the cells in some kind of hydrogel or a scaffold, and then you have to have some kind of device enabled delivery system too. Um, and so when you talk about cells, it's not the same as getting an injectable or having a pill. It's a completely different ball game, and we have to consider that. Um, and this makes a huge difference because there are only certain things that are probably addressable with cell therapies and not others. And so you have to think about the discovery theme. What is the thing in need? You know, what is the medical need for your therapy, right? And is there really a utility for it? Um, is, is it like too hard to use? Right. If it's something that a small molecule or biologic that can inject can take care of, do you really need, you know, a cell therapy? Those are questions at basic level of why you need cell therapies. Is it opening the avenue to a new um, a therapeutic um, uh, application to treat a disease that's you know underserved? Another thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about cells. It's not chemistry anymore, right? You're talking about biology. And so manufacturability, scalability, and you know, COGS, you know, uh, cost of goods, not the same as peptide drugs, not the same as nucleic acids, not the same as small molecules. It's very, very different. Those things are process, you know, are, are chemistry based. But once you have things that are biology based, it's a completely different ball game. And you know, you have to consider that some companies, you know, aren't uh, some pharmaceutical companies are not capable of going that route because they weren't set up that way. And so the manufacturability and the scalability part of it is something you have to take in consideration, whether it's um, the right use of cell therapies. And the third one that you have to keep in mind too is commercial potential, right? Um, even if the cell therapy that you're looking at, even if it's successful, 
is there a large enough uh, patient population that can afford the therapy, right? Um, and are there, when I say teams here, you know, if you have a cell therapy, you also have to have a team of people at the hospital that can deliver it too. It's not like an injectable or a pill that just pop it, you know, with a patient at home. You're going to actually need a, a healthcare team that can um, be able to place the device and the cells into your patient. Now, okay, so that's the broad context of where cell therapies are. But it's really funny because these days, a lot of weird things have happened. In the beginning, when people talked about cell therapies, that just meant implanting cells. And that came from the you know, world of transplantation, right? When people did liver transplants or you know, islet transplants, those are pretty well known. And then eventually when people were able to generate IPS cells, they were saying, hey, well, can we make IPS cells and convert them into tissues? Um, and, you know, that's so in the early days, I guess about you know, 15 years ago when IPS cells were invented, people started doing these things and it turned out to be, you know, kind of hard. Right. Uh, one of the reasons is that when you have cells, right, you think, OK, well, I'll just put it onto, let's say, cardiac. Right. You have a heart failure. You maybe have a heart attack and you have damaged heart uh, tissue. Uh, we'll just put some cardiac sh cells right on top of the heart. And the first thing you find out is that these cells move. Right. They're not anchored. And if they move somewhere else, then you've got problems because the um, the lesion that you're trying to address is localized. So it's in situ. That's what I mean here, that it's certain places cells have to stay. And if you don't have an anchoring me mechanism, you got real problems. It's going to be very, very hard. In the early days, people thought once you got the cells, the disease is treated uh, not so easy. And so the challenge here then would be the integration of your implanted cells and to make sure these cells aren't rejected. When people make IPS cell lines, they're usually from a patient. And unless you genetically engineer them, you know, to not be recognized, which is a relatively new thing, right? Your body will reject it. And if that's the case, then you have to put them on lifelong um, <clears throat> uh, immunosuppressants. And that's, you see this with heart transplants, liver transplant, islet transplant, all of them need lifelong immunosuppression, right? And so there are real challenges to the system, but it is very alluring if you can get past those challenges. The second type of cell therapy, and these are the ones that people think of these days. In fact, when you say cell therapies, people think of CAR T cells, all right? Uh, it didn't used to be like this, but um, in the past uh, eight years or so, you know, CAR T cells have become very popular. And now it's, they've taken over the entire, you know, lingo of cell therapy. That's the first thing that people think of. And that's different because that's an immunological treatment. And I won't get into what a CAR T cell is, because that's a little bit beyond our context here. But the idea is that it's an immuno, immunostimulatory system that's targeting basically tumors, right? Uh, liquid tumors, solid tumors they're trying now. And this needs to be systemic. So it's not really in situ. You're invoking um, uh, T cells. Uh, you're back adding T cells that you've engineered to attack your tumor. So this is a systemic treatment. Um, and there is a challenge for this too. You know, first of all, you have to remove the uh, T cells from the patient and expand them. So manufacturing and creating sufficient dose of a billion cells, you know, in time to give it back to the patient before they die, not so easy. And on top of that, it's a brutal treatment. And because these things are designed to kill your tumors quickly, um, you end up with these uh, a lot of um, tumor fragments that creates a cytokine storm. And that becomes very, very difficult for the patient. And so, of course, you know, there are about seven or eight a CAR T cell or NK cell or CAR T cells at this point products out on the market now. Um, and they all have uh, similar problems in terms of really being a highly tolerated type of cell therapy, but yet sometimes it's life saving. So that's a different type of cell therapy. What we want to talk about today as a lead in is that there's a third type of um, cell therapy that people kind of forgot. And this was one of the original ones too. And it's the concept of a biofactory. In other words, you have recombinant cells that you put inside a hard device, you know, an actual implant, you know, a plastic implant. And you put this onto the location that you need to be in the body, right? Um, and from there, it can secrete the recombinant drug perpetually. Right. And so this would take the place of having a injection of a biologic. Right. Um, and examples of this, and I'll talk more about um, a Neurotech's uh, encapsulated cell therapy ECT device. Um, that's one that's actually past phase three. There are other twos uh, that came out um, that has, uh, well, Sigalon, uh, they're trying to use alginates for 
the encapsulation material, and that turned out to be fibrotic and inflammatory, and uh, it actually caused patients harm in the clinical trial, so that was dropped very, very quickly. Um, Avenge is kind of like an offshoot of Sigalon's idea of using these implanted cells, except they know that alginate is pro-inflammatory, so they selected inflammatory alginates on purpose to invoke the immune system and create um, secreted IL-2, which is inflammatory. It's a it's immuno, uh, cytokine that uh, induces inflammation and immunity in hopes that this could be a good anti-cancer treatment. And they rely on the fibrosis that forms to be an off switch to turn off the alginate pellets that contain the cells. So it's a safety switch. So it's an inversion of what you usually think about um, encapsulated cell technology, but um, it's interesting take. So they're, they're going to be in the clinic soon. It'll be interesting how that goes. But for our conversation today, I'd like to focus on Neurotech uh, because they're an ophthalmic company and they actually have passed phase three clinical trials um, for their device. And what is their device? Well, basically, it's a tubular design. And if you see on the left hand side here, it's a tubular design. Um, and it's about the size of a grain of rice. And there are ARP19, recombinant ARP19 cells in there that are genetically engineered to produce growth factors. It can also produce antibodies, antibody fragments, anything that a modern biologic can be made, they can make in um, ARP19 and encapsulate it into this tube, right? The tubes, of course, they're sealed at both ends with a glue ball and this titanium loop. And then you have a surgical suture onto the edge of the eye, right? And it's implanted into the eye. And because it doesn't interfere with your field of vision, it doesn't you know, block this area here, it's implanted at an angle, um, you can't see it and people can't see it, right? And so it basically floats in your vitreous or tethered to your vitreous in an invisible kind of way. Uh, but what happens though is that the cells on the inside, um, they're very hardy. And what happens is the oxygen and nutrients within the vitreous, it can go through this a uh, plastic shell because it's semi-permeable, you have pores inside, um, and feed these cells. And these cells, because they're recombinant, they can come out and uh, secrete therapeutic factors, in this case, the cytokines. And, and um, the one that passed the phase three clinical trial is a cytokine called CNTF. The semi-permeable membrane here allows uh, the uh, therapeutic factors to come out and it's small enough so that it blocks immune system components. So this is a highly, highly engineered device, and it took, ooh, you know, almost 15 years of work to make it as simple and as elegant as it seems here. Okay, and so this is what it looks like at the end, right? Um, what happens is that the uh, device, as I said, you can only see it when you dilate the eyes, and then the uh, the, the the devices in the back, and you can see it very clearly. But under normal circumstance. It's obscured by the iris and you don't see it. Uh, so people outside can't look in and the patient looking out can't see it either. Um, and, and I always say that you know, it's a wonderful thing because you have 100% patient adherence, right? Um, a lot of times you're always afraid what the patient will do when he goes home. But in a case like this, you never have to worry about the patient saying, I don't like this. I think I'm going to remove this, right? No one is going to operate on their own eye at home. So you, you can rest assured that uh, this is a, a very a safe and convenient way to have a permanent implant into a person. OK, so what does this mean, though? Um, so it did take them almost 20 years to go from finding a cell line to creating um, you know, secreting cell line that had the appropriate amount of drugs to getting a device and to engineer and serially engineering device so it can last as long as it does. Um, and then finding the right application. And the application they found was macular telangiectasia. It's a rare disease. It's kind of like retinitis pigmentosa, but it's even rarer than that, okay? At first, this device, this NT501 implant, was designed for retinitis pigmentosa and also geographic atrophy, right? Um, but those clinical trials came up kind of ambiguous. Uh, so they focused on this ultra rare disease, this macular telangiectasia, um, and uh, see if this retinal degeneration could be stopped, you know, with the implant of uh, their, uh, their CNTF device. And lo and behold, it works. And you can see the response rate reduction uh, of, um, of uh, retinal degeneration is 56% uh, versus 29% in a protocol B, right? So it actually worked pretty well. Um, and as a result, the FDA approved this. And uh, hopefully soon you can 
get this on the market. At least if you go to the website, you can track the progress as this proceeds to the market so that at least this uh, patient population can benefit from this therapy. Now, one thing that's uh, really interesting about this, and this is where I think you know the future is, right? To me, this clears any sense of doubt that cell therapies, implanted cell therapies can work if it's protected, right? Why? Because first of all, and you know, check this out, when they were explanting some of these um, devices, not all of them, because some of the patients want to keep them in, right? Um, you have, you know, you have a response rate uh, that's good, and also you have good production. You can actually measure the amount of CNTF that's produced before and after, right? And it doesn't change that much. In other words, the secretion is durable. And you see, you get about 44 picogram, uh, picograms per mil. And of course, there's some uh, standard deviation depending on the patient. But by and large, you know, these things work. They secrete before the implant, they secrete after you take them out. So it, it truly is a durable device. And um, if you take a look inside, you cut these uh, cells, uh, this device open, the cells inside were, you know, very, very active and uh, very healthy looking, even after 14.5 years of implant. Think about that, 14.5 years. These are immortalized cells, and the material was designed to be non-fibrotic. Of course, it um, doesn't have to, they don't have to worry about that because it's floating inside the vitreous. So they have the right disease, the right implant site, the right cells, making the right growth factor. And it's durable for 14.5 years. This is truly amazing, truly, truly amazing. And the great thing is that because it's in the eye, right, they didn't find any anti-CNTF antibodies, you know, from the patient, nor did they find antibodies to the NT501 cell lines. These are ARP19 cells. So the cell line you know, apparently is not so immunogenic, you know, especially in the eye. Um, and so I think this is pretty cool because this broke the barrier, I think, to having recombinant cells as a cell therapy. And this is the first time it was done. Other people have tried, and I think in the future, if you want to go systemic with a cell therapy, um, especially as in a device where it's retrievable, where it's safe, um, I think, you know, there's, there's some challenges ahead, right? And the eye is a specialized case. The brain also, uh, will not evoke a fibrotic response. So the brain would be a safe place to put this type of device. Uh, but once we get in systemic, I think uh, things will have to change quite a bit uh, because you have fibrosis, you have direct interaction with the tissues around it, and you will invoke some kind of injury response. And so as a result, I think, you know, engineering will have to be improved and hopefully, you know, Ryan will pick it up from this point uh, to the point where this can be used in a system uh, systemic fashion. So, my conclusion is that therapeutic cell implants are possible. Okay, Neurotech proves this. They've broken the barrier to that. Um, and I think that the biocompatibility, the biocompatibility of the materials is the core, is the key, the core to success. Um, if it's not truly biocompatible and transparent to the host, then you're going to have some kind of immune response, and that's going to limit the durability and have huge problems. But if the material that's in direct contact is, um, is immuno silent enough where it's ignored by the immune system, then there's a good chance that this could have much better durability and lead to a true therapeutic application that could last for years. Um, so that's basically what I have to say. Oh, good, I made my time limit. And I guess I'll hand it over back to, you know, Cam. Perfect. Thank you so much, Vincent. Uh, and so this will be kind of a short brief questions uh, and answers session. If you guys have any questions, there's uh, at the very top of the page, there's a Q&A tab that you can click on and write your questions in. And we'll give probably about like a minute or two minutes for people. Uh, the first question is, uh, let's see. Can you tell the audience approximately how many patients will use this technology? Do you think it would be possible to modify the device to use it either for other applications outside the eye, which I think you kind of started going into with the brain. Yeah, but just so. yeah. so uh, in terms of the Neurotech device, uh, well over three, 400. 
Um, the idea is that the macular telangiectasia, I mean, the patient population isn't large, right? But they had already tried this in retinitis pigmentosa and geographic atrophy, which is a uh, dry AMD. And so there were at least 150 in each trial. So it, it must be at least 300 or more. And they also had other implants too for other eye diseases. Um, uh, when I was there, I worked on uh, anti-VEGF. So we put it into uh, wet AMD patients as well. So I'm sure the number of patients now must be over 400. And then the, the second part to that question uh, was just, do you think it's possible to modify the device to use it for other applications outside the eye? Oh, yes, for sure. For sure. Yes. Uh, and Ryan will talk about that. <laughs> yep. Perfect. <laughs> any other any other questions? Uh, you can, oh, we got one right here. Uh, what is the, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the rice? Yeah, it's yeah, it's not really made of rice. It's just, It looks like a, a grain of rice, but it's not really. Um, actually, do I have one here? Uh, sorry, I don't. Uh, yeah. So I can show you right here if you want to see. This is a real device, okay? And it's this small, 400,000 cells. All right, and uh, what's it made of? Well, the outside shell is made of polysulfone, um, and that's a semi-permeable membrane. Uh, yeah, they have a, a special system to make this. It's not something you just buy off the shelf. And on the inside, there are there's a scaffold made of uh, PET, um, and that's the anchor so the cells can grow on the inside. Great. Thank you, Vincent, for answering those. If you have any more questions for Vincent, uh, please do type them in the Q&A. We'll go over all the rest of the questions at the end, too, if there's more questions for any of the presenters. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next maybe up, I, can, I, can also, oh. I can also add to have <laughs> can't help it. I have these demo things, right? <laughs> um, so this is actually what's delivered into the OR, right, uh, by FedEx. I don't know if you can see, but basically it's like a jelly jar, right? And then you have the whole device that's inside, right? You peel back this lid here. And you remove, this is basically this guy, the rice device, right, with media inside. And you basically have it inside media. And this can last about a month inside an incubator, and the cells won't die. They're that hardy. And so once you get into the operating room, the surgeon peels the thing back, and then he takes this out, and he removes this, and he does the surgery. That's a great visual uh, representation of it too. That's nice that you have that in hand. Thank you so much, Vincent, again. Uh, we'll now move on to Rayan Hadroj. Uh, and like I said, guys, if you have any more questions for Vincent, please feel free to leave them either in the chat or the Q&A and we'll come back around to them at the end. Thank you. Okay, so I will share my screen. Okay, um, so I guess to start for Anyone who has just joined, my name is Ryan Hudroj, and I am the Director of Device Development here at Bioservices. Um, I've been here for about a little over five years now, and the majority of my time here, I've worked on the development of the Biospawn cell chamber. So I'm very excited to talk about it here with you guys. Um, to start, just a little overview of what I will be talking about today. Um, I'll be talking about, about the clinical need and why our chamber is important. Um, a little bit over the background of the biospawn technology. Since the majority of the cell chamber is made out of electrospawn materials, I will go into that a little bit. Um, the majority of my talk will be about the cell chamber development, including benchtop and in vivo testings. Um, and then I will go into conclusions and future developments. So before we get into the science or the technical part of the presentation, I wanted to spend a few seconds to address the market for long-term therapeutics. So there are billions of dollars that are being spent on finding treatments for diabetes, for um, chronic illnesses, and for liver diseases, but there's still no perfect solutions. Um, there are limited delivery options for the current treatments out there, and that's one of the issues. Other issues include the side effects that come with each medications, um, patient compliance, which can be very inconsistent, um, especially if they are required to either go to a you know, hospital, a clinic, doctor's office, if they're getting some sort of injection that they need a nurse or a doctor to administrate. Um, so that could become very inconsistent on their part um, if they do not make the trip or if they forget to take a pill for medication or anything like that. 
Um, so that becomes an, 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 an issue for the current seasons. So over here, um, so obviously the reasons that the patients need to constantly retake their medication is because the effects will wear off over time. So if you see, if you follow the white line here on this graph, these are, you know, whether you take an injection or any form of medication through a pill, obviously you get a peak where you start to feel better and then it starts to wear off and then you have to do it again and again and again. Um, and so with our biospan cell chamber or the goal of restorative cell therapeutics would be to provide a consistent therapeutic benefit over an extended period of time. That way, you know, for example, with our chamber, it would get implanted and then the chamber will um, give off the drug by itself without the patient having to go over and retake the medication over and over again. It'll be kind of the chamber's job to just administer that, that therapeutic over, over time. And so with the long-term biologic drug delivery, we have different options, which Vincent has um, went over a little bit. Um, so we have macro devices, we have micro capsules and viral gene therapy. Our biospawn cell chamber goes under the macro devices um, option, which is when modified cells are loaded into the chamber and then they are implanted into the patient. And these cells would be modified to give off some, some sort of drug that is needed by the patient's um, body. And then there are microcapsules, which are a biofactory that produce that same therapeutic. And there are viral gene therapies, which are inserted directly into the patient's infected tissue, whether it's the liver, the eye, whichever it may be, and then it will produce the drug. And with each of these options, there are issues that come with it. Um, current macro devices like this one will elicit um, a fibrotic response since it is a foreign object in the body, so the body will try to attack it. Um, this picture here is actually a sneak peek of what I will be talking about a little bit later. Um, we actually compared our chambers with this type of chamber, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but this is what fibrosis would look like when the body attacks this foreign object that's in the body. And then with, you know, whether it's injections or viral gene therapy, um, the issue comes with viral persistent, irretrievability. If um, the drug is spread, there's an issue, you can't really get it back. Um, and there are safety concerns as well. Um, so now that the background um, is sort of, um, you know, um, demonstrated, we are going to go into the biospan technology, so which is electro spinning. Um, I have a short video here that will just kind of go over um, what electrospinning is. So I'll just play that. So that is the gist of what electrospinning is. Um, so not only is the process cost effective, um, we also do it in a room temperature um, based process. Um, it is reproducible. Obviously, biosurfaces has been around for many years and we've been able to produce um, many, many, many sheets. Um, it is scalable and we can infuse any drug or agent into the process itself. So it won't be something that is added on after the material is made. Um, we can incorporate the drug into each um, individual fiber with our process. And so the electrospinning process will result in a formation of materials made from nanofibers, which is this middle picture right here. Um, this structure is similar to the scaffold that the body uses, which is on the left photo, but it's very different than the industry standard. So this is what um, the industry standard is. As you, as you can see, the fibers are very, very big, and this is what the body would um, recognize as a foreign object, and it would try to wall it off. It would try to kick, it, to kick it out, which would result in fibrosis. And so I think what we have learned is that fiber size really does matter when it comes to healing inside the body. Now, to get on to um, the biospawn cell chamber, which is made, majority of it is made out of the electrospawn materials. Um, just to get into a little bit of how we came to our current design of the cell chamber. Um, I mean, throughout the years when designing this, we um, wanted the cell chamber 
Our ultimate goal was to create something that is nanofibrous that promotes tissue and growth from the outside, but also allows therapeutic cells to proliferate on the inside. So we needed to create something that has an ability to load cells through a port, um, which you can see the design of the port over the years has improved. That was our biggest um, thing that we needed to work on. Um, we also needed to have a design which you can um, protect the inside cells. So these two, these are both Gen 3 because they have the same wall structure. So the difference from Gen 1, Gen 2 to Gen 3 is that we added a porous filter that will protect the inside cells from the um, outside cells. So the outside cells will not be able to get into the cell chamber um, and attack the inside cells. Um, we have also made the edges much smoother. Um, we've done some studies in the past where using a chamber in this size um, was not good for the animal. It actually poked out of the skin a bit. So we adjusted the size, made it a little bit slimmer. Um, we made the corners a little bit more rounded. Um, and we have also um, came up with a better sealing um, process by using an ultrasonic welder. So um, once the cells are loaded, an ultrasonic welder is used to seal the top. The ultrasonic welder is also made to make the chamber itself since it seals and um, welds at the same time. These are our current um, cell chambers. These are the different sizes that we have made. Um, so each size depends on the implant location, but they are all made out of the same exact materials. They are all Gen 3 um, cell chambers. For these two, we have tested in vivo and in vitro. Um, this one in the middle here has been used for subcutaneous implants. The small one here has been used for subdural implants in rats' brains. Um, this big one here would be the human-sized version of the cell chamber, um, and it would be implanted in the omentum area. So as you can see, um, the shape and size of the cell chamber is pretty flexible as we can make it into different shapes and sizes. Um, now, in regards of the composition of the cell chamber, I talked briefly about the PET filter in the middle, um, which is to protect the inside cells from the outer um, body cells getting in. The different, the other um, layers would be the polyurethane layer that is on the inside of the cell chamber, and this one allows um, for the cells to grow and to proliferate, proliferate. Um, and it allows them to attach and to produce the therapeutic drug. There is also an outer PET layer, uh, which is polyester. This is also electrospun. And the polyester prevents fibrosis and it serves as a tissue um, integration matrix. So this is what all of our cell chambers are made out of. Now shown here are the specifications for the three different sized chambers that we have developed. Um, the dimensions differ depending on where the implant is um, would be located. Our smallest tubular cell, cell chamber can be made to be five millimeters long that we have implanted in the brain of rats, which I will show uh, momentarily. And then we can also make that tubular chamber to be 10 millimeters long. Um, and we have implanted the, the longer one subcutaneously in the rat's back. The medium sized chambers um, have been implanted again subcutaneously. And the large size chambers will be implanted, like I said, in the omentum region. And so these will be the cell loading capacity for the smaller chambers, 10 to 50,000. The medium chambers will be 1 to 10 million, and the larger chambers will be 10 to 100 million cells. Um, and so Vincent talked about the ARPE 19 cells a bit, uh, but these are the cells that we have also used in our studies. Um, so they have all the characteristics that are listed here. Most importantly is that they can also be genetically modified to produce drugs such as Antibio, Humira, and Stellara. Um, and they were also modified to produce luc um, luciferase, which gives them the ability to luminesce. It makes it easier for us to measure through the IVIS to keep track of cell viability. So these are the cells that we have implanted in the chamber. Now to get into our in vitro and in vivo studies. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about how the cells are loaded, since obviously we go through this process before every study. Um, so the chamber is first taken out of its packaging and it comes preloaded with the needle already in it. Um, this 24 well is just used to hold it still. 
Um, then it is loaded with these cells using a syringe. Um, after the cells are loaded in, the syringe is taken out. The cell chamber is put into a um, into a little clamp, and then the ultrasonic welder is used to cut and seal um, the chamber at the top. So then after the chamber is cut and sealed and loaded, it is gone through a few different rinses just to make sure that no chambers from the inside got out in the sealing process. Once it has been through its rinses, it is stored in a six well plate and moved on to imaging. So from here, um, we can see the cell chambers are luminescing. So we have 2.5 million chambers, uh, I'm sorry, 2.5 million cells in this first row. We have 5 million cells here and 10 million cells here. And you can see that as the cell number increases, so does the luminescence. So this is how we keep track of cell viability when they are inside the chambers. Next, um, we are also um, we can also keep track of antibio secretion. So this shows here that all the chambers are glowing. They're all viable. Um, this graph here also shows that even over the course of 40 days, the antibio, which is the drug that the cells were modified to produce, was coming out up until 40 and even over 40 days. And then these chambers will be implanted in um, nude mice, which is what we are showing here. So this is the Gen 3 cell chamber implanted in the back of a nude mouse. And over here, you can also see the IVUS. So even when the when, even when these cell chambers are implanted in the mice, we can still um, view them with the IVUS machine, and we can see that the cells are luminescing even over the course of 74 days. They are still viable, um, and you can still see them glow. This next slide here is to compare our cell chamber with this parasite device. So this is um, the picture that I had showed earlier with fibrosis. And I think it's pretty clear here that our cell chamber has not shown um, really any significant significant fibrosis compared to the to the thericide device even after 136 days. Um, so these are what day 64 looks like on both types of the chambers. Our chamber made up to 136 days, and you can see that it is still clean and there are no real signs of fibrosis. Um, we have some trichrome staining here just to show our cell chamber compared to the thericite. So we have on the left side here our cell chamber, and you can kind of see the different layers. So you have the PET electrospun on the outside here. You can see the PET membrane would be this little line right here. And this is where the electrospun PU is. And this is where the ARPE19 cells are right, right between the two PU layers. And the diff I think the biggest difference between the two pictures here is with the thericide device, you see this really big collagen zone, which indicates fibrosis. Whereas with our biospun cell chamber, the collagen zone is very, very, very small. Um, and I think that um, shows nice tissue integration. Um, there really isn't any signs of um, fibrosis like the thericide device is showing. And um, this is our biospun cell chamber after 30 days. Um, this is an H and &E, um, histology and I think you can see again the different layers so this is the ultrasound PET, PET barrier and the ultrasound PU and these are the ARPE19 cells and I think you can see very good um, tissue integration capillaries were forming in the PET layer um, again no growth signs of fibrosis and you can see that the ARPE19 cells are um, inside the cell chamber and they were consistently given off um, the drug. So not only did we test Antivio drug release, we also tested um, Humira and Stellara. And you can see here, so the graphs show 150 days the drugs were still coming out, but we also continued the study and the drugs were still coming out for over 270 days um, in the mice, which is which is pretty impressive, I think. Um, we also did one more test just to really um, test our electrical materials. So what we did here, this shows some histology of the PET porous membrane um, implanted by itself. So that's what this picture is right here. Um, there is no electrical material surrounding it, um, but we just wanted to see how this would react in the body without electrical materials versus with electrical materials. So this is that same PET filter, but it is surrounded 
by PET on one side and PU on the other side, just like it is in the cell chambers. Um, and as you can see, the difference between the two pictures, this PET membrane here has a lot of collagen around it. Um, it has significant fibrosis, whereas in this picture, it was protected by the electrical materials. You really see minimal fibrosis. And again, you see very good tissue integration in the electrospun PET with capillaries forming. And um, again, very, very minimal fibrosis. Um, so now to get into our subdural chambers um, for benchtop and um, in vivo data. So this is what our we call our mini cell chambers. Um, they are made from the same exact material, again, as the subcutaneous chambers, our Gen 3 cell chambers. Um, but these are much, much smaller. So these are about five millimeters in length and about 1.5 millimeters in width. Um, the maximum loading volume for these is about two microliters. And, you know, in humans, the size chamber could be used in the eye, like um, what Vincent had talked about. It could also be used in other confined um, spaces that needs very, very small devices like this. This just shows, shows a cross check. This just shows a cross check section of the cell chambers. So you can see here the inner diameter is about 730 microns, so 0.7 millimeters, and the outer diameter is about one millimeter. And again, these um, chambers were, were again um, loaded with cells. Um, we put about 50,000 cells into each of these chambers and sealed them, um, and they were viewed with the IBIS machine again. And you can see that, that they are all glowing, which um, indicates cell viability. For um, the in vitro data, so these are the interview release and the IVIS luminescence signal. And again, over the course of 65 days, interview was still being produced um, and they were still luminescing, which shows that they are still viable even over the course of 65 days. Um, these chambers were then implanted into the brains of rats. Um, this picture he showed, shows a control. There are no cells in this chamber. Obviously, it is not glowing. The picture on the right here shows a cell-loaded chamber, and you can see it is nice and bright. Um, this is at day 49, um, and it's still giving off very, very good signal. And in terms of intibio release for the in vivo, um, at, after 49 days, you can see that, that the intibio was still being released. And this is the luminescence data. And you can see again, over 49 days, the cells are still viable and they are still glowing. This is what the implants looked, um, well, when they were explanted. This one is a no cell control. You can see it looks pretty nice and clean. This is with the cells, again, still nice and clean. Um, and this is after 50 days of them being implanted. Um, no growth signs of fibrosis. And they looked pretty clean after 50 days. Um, this here is just shows a histology of a seven-day implant. This was not loaded with any cells. But this just shows that the cell chambers, um, you know, the mini cell chamber, um, it shows good positioning in the subdural space, and you don't, you don't really see any, any adverse effects. Um, we have some more histology here after 23 days of implants in vivo. Um, and this picture right here shows a non-cell loaded chamber. This one has cells in it. And um, again, you can see very well tissue integration in the PET, electrospun PET. Um, you can see that there are no cells in the non-cell loaded one, which means that no cells infiltrated the cell chamber. Um, the PET membrane did its job and it kept everything out. Same thing with here. Um, the only cells inside the ch cell chamber are the ARPE19 cells that we had loaded into it. This is some immunohistochemistry staining. Um, after 23 days of implants, again, um, we have no non-cell loaded chamber, and this is a cell loaded chamber, and this just shows that the ARPE19 cells, um, they are human cells in, a, in an animal's body, and they have not been attacked from the outside. Um, so it just, again, shows minimal signs of fibrosis. The non-cell loaded one has no cells inside it, like it shouldn't have, um, which means that the outer cells did not infiltrate the cell chamber. 
Um, and also, not only did we test the plasma, but we also tested the brain tissue for the drug. Um, so after 23 days and after 50 days in both the blood of the animal and in the brain tissue, we found um, signs of drug, um, which shows that the cell chamber released it locally in the brain, but it also was released systemically in the blood as well. Um, some conclusions here. So we discussed the um, cell chamber designs, um, the ones that would be used for the brains subdurally, the mini chambers, and the omentum or subcutaneous applications. Um, and we've discussed maximum volume loading um, capabilities. Um, we also showed the mini and the standard cell, cell chamber morphological properties. Um, we went over ARPE19 cells that were modified to produce antibio and luciferase. Um, to show cell viability and drug secretion over time. Um, the subdural and the subcutaneous implantation of the cell loaded chambers maintain cell, vi cell viability and um, they were producing detectable um, levels of blood, uh, detectable levels of drug in the blood um, for the length of their respective studies. And the subdural implants of the cell chamber um, were detected in the brain tissue as well as in the blood. Um, now to get into some future directions of where we want to take this device. Um, for the human-sized um, version of the chamber, we are hoping for a laparoscopic delivery um, in the omentum space. Um, so this would allow for a minimally invasive delivery of the cell chamber. For the mini cell chambers, um, again, I went over this a little bit, but they can be made to be a little bit longer. This one right here is 10 millimeters in length instead of five. The maximum loading capacity will be four mic microliters in instead of two. And this would be um, even able, this would be able to be have made even longer for um, other applications. We are also working on a Gen 4 cell chamber, which is a condo design. Um, and so over here, we have um, put some inner leaflets inside the cell chamber to give it maximum surface area. So with the inner leaflets, the um, cells would have four extra surfaces for them to grow on. We have some in, vi in vitro studies here um, with some histology pictures. So over here, the cell chambers were loaded with 10 million cells. Um, and so these would be the two leaflets that we had put in there. The cells would be loaded right in between, right here in the middle. And as you can see here, the cells did make their way out um, and they were able to grow on the outer surfaces as well as the middle. This one here is 30 million cells. And same thing, they were loaded into the middle, but they made their way out and they were able to grow on all surfaces of the cell chamber. So this would allow for um, more cells to be loaded into the chamber itself. We are also working on developing a resealable port. Um, this is what a prototype would look like. It's still in the works in terms of design, um, but the idea is you would load the cells through this port. You would take out the needle and the port would reseal on its own. Um, this would eliminate the need to seal the chambers after cell loading. Um, so we're still working on design modifications right now. And the next steps would be to develop a cell loading process um, and to do in vitro and in vivo studies. Um, last but not least, I would like to thank everyone who has worked very hard on this project through these past few years. Um, so thank you to everybody on this list. And I will take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, let's see. Hey, by the way, guys, yet again, uh, if, if you missed what I said last time, you can use the chat or the Q&A section to type any questions that you have. Uh, the first question we have is, uh, can you change the composition of the cell chamber if certain cells don't grow well on polyurethane? Uh, yes, we've actually um, done um, other iterations of the cell chamber where the inside would be either our electrospawn polyester. Um, we actually have had customers um, purchase our um, IVRT research tools where they can grow cells on different kinds of materials. They can see which material is best for their cell growth 
and then we can uh, modify our cell chamber to to put any material on the inside that that the cells um, prefer. Great, thank you for answering that. The second question is, since the chambers come preloaded with the needle, is there a chance of them poking through the chamber and creating a hole? Um, so the needle that is in the chamber right now is um, a blunt tip, so it, it, there is no chance of it poking through. Um, with the resealable port, we would be using a sharp needle for it to pierce through the um, the port, but at that point it will not be um, preloaded. You'll just go in there, we'll load the cells, and then take it out. Okay, great. And I think the last question we have here is, what diseases could this chamber be used to treat, and is the company working on any of these areas? So the chamber could be used to treat really any type of disease where the cells can be genetically modified to to um, produce that drug. Um, so right now we've tested it with um, the drugs Intivio, Solara, and Humira, um, but we can also test it with 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 others in the future. Okay, awesome. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, try to incorporate everyone's information throughout this video that I post online too, uh, just so in case you want to go back and look through and you have any other questions, you'll have their contact information as well. So thank you, Ryan, for the presentation. Next, we have Max presenting. There you go. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Perfect. Okay, should be able to see it. Great. So thank you for this invitation. Um, I'll give you just uh, a very quick introduction to Morphocell since we've been, uh, we try not to be too visible for uh, the last few years. Uh, we are a regenerative medicine startup company uh, that we founded as clinicians. We are the three founders are physician and uh, we found it to actually develop and commercialize a technology, a platform technology that we have developed to answer uh, our patients' need. Uh, we focus on stem cell-based engineered tissues, and we aim at uh, replacing uh, organ failures, starting with the liver, and then I'll, I'll, I'll guide you through that. Uh, this is a spin-off of the St. Justine Hospital, which uh, is the second largest mother-child hospital in North America, uh, and we are still preclinical. Uh, it's, uh, we are not far from the clinic, but uh, not there yet. Uh, it's a company based in Montreal, so outside the main hubs, as I said, the three founders are, are physicians, but we now obviously are expanding our team. We hired great talents to cover what are the main uh, hurdles and main issues for any cell therapy, and I'll get back to this uh, in a second. Uh, our team is uh, still small, uh, but growing. Uh, we have 23 uh, full-time employees, so obviously as a startup, uh, a lot of uh, consultants and advisors. And we are uh, based in the Greater Montreal area, which is a, a growing hub for the cell and gene therapy. Um, obviously, a lot of partners, as you can imagine, that this, uh, as every startup you need, uh, it, it actually takes a village to bring you towards uh, the clinic. Uh, and this is um, just the, the small introduction. I'll get you directly to uh, the our first target. And the reason is that, as I told you, we, we are phys physicians. So uh, I'm a pediatric hypothologist. I spent the last uh, 15 years of my career taking care of children with liver disease and being frustrated about uh, you know, seeing them uh, deteriorate and not being able to do anything uh, until the liver was too sick uh, and uh, until they were ready for a liver transplantation. And this happens in children, this happens in, happens in adults. Uh, liver disease is still killing more than 1.2 million people per year, and this doesn't include uh, cancer-related liver death. Um, we started focusing on liver failure, and the reason for this is that liver failure is the final outcome of most um, liver diseases, from cirrhosis to viral hepatitis, drug-induced liver disease, uh, acute hepatitis, NASH, metabolic liver disease, uh, alcoholic hepatitis, all of that will end up with a liver incapable of working, incapable of performing its uh, more than 500 functions, uh, and uh, will end up with complications touching basically every organ and system uh, in the body. Uh, we're talking from hepatic encephalopathy to uh, varicell bleeding, ascites, portal hypertension, uh, you know, pulmonary and uh, kidney problems, uh, and all ends up into uh, multi-organ multi failure, coma, and death. Um, 
we have three forms of liver failure. The most dramatic one, which is the nightmare for, for, for every uh, clinical hepatologist, is the acute liver failure. This is something happening in people with no pre-existing liver disease, can be a mushroom, can be a virus, can be a toxin, uh, can be a drug. It actually destroys the liver, uh, happens really fast over uh, a few hours, a few days, uh, and then the patient ends up with a liver incapable of working. Um, equally dramatic, but um, happening in people with a pre-existing liver condition is the acute on chronic liver failure. Uh, that it's aggravated by the fact that the liver is already sick uh, in the background. And then you have chronic liver failure, which is much less dramatic, but equally severe. And this is something affecting hundreds of millions of people around the world. So it's much more frequent and slowly, but certainly brings the, brings the patients to the same uh, outcome. So this is basically where we focus our effort. Why? Because uh, for these uh, conditions, there is no real therapy. The only uh, treatment, uh, and I will talk to you about this in a second, is liver transplantation, uh, and the need is huge. If you just look at the most severe forms, so ALF and CLF, the market is huge. We're talking about $14 billion market uh, increasing. Despite all our efforts to improve these diseases, uh, we still uh, expect this to increase over the next few years. And this is just for the acute forms. The chronic ones are even much, the, the market is even much, much bigger. Um, liver transplantation, it does work. We can't replace a liver that doesn't work anymore. Uh, 8,000 transplant per year in the US, but the problem is that we don't have enough organs for everyone. So we have much more people on the waiting list than organs available, which means that we still have a significant mortality on the waiting list, or uh, we have people that are actually delisted because they are too sick uh, to uh, receive a transplant. And this is even more real and more, uh, more of a problem for uh, young children, so for, for newborns or infants, where uh, not only we have to match uh, the, uh, the blood type, but we also have to match the size of the organ, or at least part of it. Uh, even uh, liver transplantation is very expensive, so a significant burden on the healthcare system and has major limitations. So we're talking about organ shortage. We're talking about uh, significant mortality on the short uh, term. And right now, the problem is not really mortality, but it's more morbidity, which is still uh, very important. We have long-term chronic graft hepatitis, and problems that actually go on for sometimes for years with a lifelong need for immunosuppression, which brings its own complication, as you can imagine. So infections, PTLDs, uh, so tumors and other things. What's really frustrating for us uh, is the fact that the liver is very good at regenerating. So it's very good at actually uh, healing itself. Uh, we know that up to 80% of the transplant done for acute liver failure could actually be avoided if we were able to replace liver functions for the time needed by the liver to regenerate. And uh, the problem is that the body dies before the liver can actually uh, regenerate. The regenerate, liver regeneration has been known for forever. Uh, the, uh, uh, the myth of Prometheus uh, is about liver regeneration. So it's always been there. The problem is that we don't understand the process so much. And, uh, and so the only way we have to keep the patient alive is actually to replace liver function with a liver transplant. Uh, we could avoid 1,200 transplant per year just in the US and Europe uh, if we were able to provide transient uh, liver, uh, transient replacement of liver functions. Uh, so do we really need liver transplantation, at least for acute liver failure? Uh, there are alternatives that have been studied and have been assessed uh, in the field. Um, two main uh, research uh, fields, I would say. One is extracorporeal liver function replacement, and the other one is regenerative medicine. The extracorporeal liver function replacement uh, was a, a, actually proved a, a little bit disappointing over the years with several machines that have been approved, but actually uh, proved uh, to have very little uh, clinical impact with clinical trials that actually uh, were much uh, worse than what we expected at the beginning. And this is with or without uh, a biological component. Uh, where we are focusing our effort is regenerative medicine, uh, because uh, regenerative medicine can provide liver function uh, through two different uh, actually approaches. One is liver cell therapy, 
that's where Morphosel is positioning itself. The other one is uh, organ regeneration, so to accelerate the regeneration of the organ. And you will see that we are uh, touching this as well. Uh, liver, cell liver cell transplantation, so liver cell therapy, has been out there for more than 20 years. Uh, very easy uh, as a concept. So basically, we obtain liver cells, so hepatocytes from adult livers, uh, and then we re-inject these cells into a patient with liver failure. Uh, we have to replace a significant part of the liver cells, so 5 to 10 percent of the theoretical liver mass. Uh, it's much less invasive. Uh, it's not a real surgery. Uh, it's fully re reversible and it's absolutely cheaper. So why it's not in every hospital after 20, 25 years? Uh, because it doesn't really work for uh, this specific application. We do have proofs that liver cell therapy actually has a, an effect. Uh, there are several reports of using liver cell therapy, liver cell transplantation in metabolic liver diseases, where uh, actually we do see uh, some function replacement where there is a single enzyme uh, deficiency. And you can see here examples of uh, several diseases. The problem is that uh, there is a, a need for several injections. You can see Every single arrow is an injection. Uh, there is, uh, and the the effect takes a lot of time uh, to actually uh, appear, and it needs uh, it doesn't last uh, long. So there are main limitations of using hepatocytes, so primary human hepatocytes for cell transplantation. The first one that is for acute or acute on chronic liver failure is the fact that the engraftment takes time. So to have a proper function, uh, you need uh, sometimes several weeks. Um, a minimal function is seen uh, right away, but then it's lost and then it appears again once the cell actually engrafts, which makes it not really useful for the most acute forms of liver failure. Uh, then the main problem is organ shortage. If we don't have enough organs uh, for liver transplantation, we surely don't have enough organs for liver cell therapy. Uh, also, even if from a single organ we can do several transplants, uh, the organs that actually are received for this kind of uh, therapy are marginal organs, so organs that are actually of uh, bad quality, uh, which are uh, makes the cells uh, really variable in their function. We and others show that this uh, this um, uh, quality of the cells is completely unpredictable and it's very hard uh, to detect, to, to, to actually um, work with. Uh, we have rejection, so like in a transplant, in a transplant, so we do need immunosuppression and rejection is very hard to monitor in, this, in these patients. And the effect is very short in duration. So we, you need repeated doses, you need many donors, and you need the donors to be ready uh, to be there when the patient presents with a very short therapeutic window which means that uh, basically it's equally hard to find uh, to provide a liver cell transplantation or hepatocyte transplantation than a liver transplant. Why? Because these cells are uh, actually don't respond very well to cryopreservation, so they lose function uh, and then uh, actually uh, makes them um, really functional or mainly functional only if we use them at the uh, fresh which obviously is a major complication. So the entire field has been focusing on finding alternative sources of liver cells to replace liver functions. And obviously, since more than 10 years, uh, everyone has been looking at stem cells to generate uh, hepatocytes. Um, our own solution as Morphocell is uh, very different from a liver a, a hepatocyte transplantation because we developed a uh, what we call reliever, which is a fully mature engineered liver tissue uh, generated from stem cells, so from a sustainable source. We use induced pluripotent stem cells as a source. Uh, we designed this and off the shelf as an off the shelf product. Why? Because we can we don't have time to generate something from the patient's own cells, so we need something to be ready. Uh, for the patient when he or she presents everywhere, anywhere in the world. So we have one implant for every patient. Uh, we have an allogeneic approach, but our design uh, makes it uh, invisible to the immune system. So we have no immunosuppression needed because we have no rejection. Uh, 
the safety profile is a little bit unique, so it's designed to be retrievable, doesn't remain in the body, stays there to replace liver functions for the time needed by the liver to regenerate. Then we take it out. Uh, we have no rejection, and once again, the system is designed to also prevent uh, any kind of tumor formation, which is always an important concern for uh, stem cell derived uh, therapies. With the way we design this is that we are we developed a, uh, a a process and design and conditions that actually allow our liver organoids uh, to become fully mature uh, during the manufacturing process. This is the only stem cell the right product that's capable of achieving full maturation uh, in vitro. Uh, sometimes for competing products it takes months to achieve full maturation, months after implantation, so it needs to be in the body to become fully mature. In our case, we achieve full maturation in vitro. Uh, the, uh, we use a, a non-degradable biomaterial that we tuned so that all the nutrients, oxygen uh, can get in, uh, toxins, ammonia, and drugs can get in as well to be metabolized by the liver organoids. And the liver-specific proteins that are produced by these organoids can actually get out easily. Uh, we also use a, uh, by compatible support and then a, a, a design that allows actually the organoids inside to be completely invisible to the immune system. So the immune system from the recipient doesn't see the organoids and then cannot get into contact with them and cannot uh, so cannot produce a rejection, uh, which means that we can uh, we can be allogeneic, but we don't need immunosuppression. Uh, just to give you an idea of the way we are developing this, uh, this is our reliever product, uh, completely mature after manufacturing. It's crab preserved, uh, fully resistant to crab preservation, uh, maintains the same functions as uh, pre freezing after towing. You have a patient presenting with ALF or CLF anywhere in the world. Once again, these patients have a very short therapeutic window, so you need to be able to act quickly. Uh, we can have a call and we are uh, ready to ship and we already did this test uh, within 24 hours. All is designed to have the implant into the patient's body within 48 to 72 hours from presentation, which is often much faster than the time uh, needed for, by these patients to get a liver transplant, even in the best um, best conditions and best, best cases. Uh, we design everything to be minimally invasive. So basically, this will be implanted by laparoscopy into the peritoneal cavity. We don't need any vascularization. We don't need any anastomosis. Uh, we use the peritoneal fluid for exchanges, which allows us to maintain a allogeneic approach without immunosuppression, and which makes the surgery extremely easy uh, and doable by any uh, surgeon without a special training. Uh, the way it works, it replaces liver functions, uh, so maintaining the patients alive, uh, treats hepatic encephalopathy, which is the main complication of liver failure and often the cause of death, and also accelerates the, liver reg uh, the regeneration of the patient's own liver, which means that we act on both uh, replacing functions and accelerated regeneration. Uh, once the liver regenerates, we actually explant it, we take it out. So easy procedure, uh, once again, minimal invasive, and we have nothing residual in the uh, in the body, which is uh, an important um, safety uh, profile, at least for a first uh, product. Uh, just to give you some an idea of the how this works, this is a very severe fulminant liver failure model in mice. Uh, these are normal immunocompetent mice that actually receive a deadly dose of CCL4, which destroys the liver. We wait them for to be very sick, so we wait 24 hours, and at that point we implant either the human uh product or just an empty biomaterial and uh, uh, we give no immunosuppression so it's human into mouse uh immunocompetent mouse without immunosuppression and you can see that survival is very different so we have 140 percent improvement in survival at five weeks um so 68 percent versus 29 percent and uh what's interesting is that at five weeks we actually remove the implant and we follow the mice for another two months, showing that basically they were completely cured. So they were healthy without anything foreign in their uh, body. Uh, this works, as I said, by acting on hepatic encephalopathy, uh, among others. Uh, the mice that were treated, actually, they have much less frequent um, neurological signs. They are less severe. They last 
uh, for a shorter period of time and ammonia levels are much lower in animals that are actually uh, received the treatment. This we have pro um, preliminary uh, confirmation in large animals. So this is the stage where uh, we are now, where we show that uh, intracranial pressure and ammonia are actually uh, reduced with this kind of uh, design. Um, we do have uh, obviously, as I said, also an effect on the regeneration of the subject's own liver. Uh, you can see mice, uh, when we look at the livers of the mice from the same experiment I showed you before, uh, and we take the liver of survivors from both groups at day 24, meaning that these were animals surviving long term, uh, we look at the livers and it's very different. So uh, animals receiving the uh, reliever were had, had livers that were in much better shape, so almost normal at histology, whereas controls, uh, despite having blood tests that were almost normal at the time, they still showed a work in progress in terms of regeneration. And we showed that regeneration is much uh, more, um, much faster actually in the treated mice, and already 72 hours we see massive regeneration in the animal's liver. Uh, we have a strong immune isolation uh, provided by the biomaterial that we're using. And then so basically the uh, human organoids within the biomaterial are completely invisible to the immune system. The immune cells cannot penetrate the biomaterial. Uh, obviously, we, pray, we play with the porosity of, of the material itself. And then uh, we have uh, so the organoids are completely untouched even when we put human uh, or, or human implant into uh, immunocompetent mice. Uh, and once again, if nothing gets in, nothing gets out. So basically, am I talking about cells here? Obviously, uh, it's a contained system. So the cells that are inside cannot escape, which is very important for uh, tumor prevention, uh, especially for a uh, really first uh, first in human approach of this kind of uh, products. Uh, we have no, det no detectable tumors in more deficient mice. Not even when we put cancer cells. Into, uh, into our uh, biomaterial, so showing that really nothing can expand, a, a, uh, escape. And not to forget that it's designed to be removed, so nothing stays in uh, long term. Uh, obviously, we have a significant competitive edge uh, for this design, so we this is the only uh, product that's capable of replacing liver functions right away. I write here from day one, but we know that uh, we have proof, obviously, that uh, uh, fun liver functions are already replaced starting two hours after implantation. Um, we do uh, accelerate the regeneration of the recipient's own liver, so this can be not only a treatment, but a cure for many and a bridge, a bridge to transplant for the most severe cases. Uh, designed to be allogeneic, but no need of, of immunosuppression, and with it, the safety profile that's been really built into the design uh, from the beginning. Uh, everything uh, was designed, once again, to be logistically sound. We are clinicians, so we do know that change of practice are hard to implement. Uh, so basically, everything is designed to be easy to uh, ship, to receive. We, uh, you don't need any special facility, any clean room in the receiving hospital. It doesn't change, basically, the way uh, surgeons and clinicians operate in the receiving hospitals. Uh, where we are right now, uh, we are uh, really in the uh, scaling up our entire system. Uh, the beauty of our, our setup and uh, the expertise we built in the company is that everything is designed for commercial scale. So we are not going just to the clinic. Uh, we want to get to the commercial stage uh, right away. So we internalize everything. We are uh, applying a quality by design approach and uh, we will uh, soon be in, uh, in a, a, a proper proof of concept in large animals with IND enabling studies that will uh, start as soon as the, uh, the uh, full scale is uh, achieved. Uh, our clinical trial is 30 months away and uh, happy to, to confirm that we haven't uh, updated our schedule for the last nine months. So uh, we are on track and then uh, very happy to be moving forward. Obviously, with an eye on uh, what's beyond. So this is a platform. Uh, we control the uh, delivery method uh, we, uh, with a strong safety and a immune shielding. But most of all, we control the development from the IPS cells 
through the endoderm and all the organs beyond. So this can go uh, not only to acute and acute on chronic liver failure, but uh, chronic liver failure, metabolic liver diseases, and obviously well beyond the liver. So I finish with this, and then I think it gives you an idea of what we are doing and then how we are positioning ourselves in the uh, cell therapy space. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Max. That was extremely informative. Uh, I have one question already to start from Elizabeth. Uh, she said, typically organoids need a matrix to grow and sustain them. How is this achieved inside the reliver? Yeah, and this is a very good point. It's exactly true. So basically, uh, organoids, our organoids can grow in suspension. So we obviously have process to grow them in suspension, but full maturation, uh, obviously needs also the external environment, which is provided by the power by material. Great. Uh, the next question is, can you tell me how the toxins are removed from the body using the reliver device? Yeah, the uh, the organoids themselves actually metabolize. So the main toxin that we are interested in is obviously ammonia, uh, which is one of the main determinants of hepatic encephalopathy. And ammonia is very effectively metabolized by reliever. Uh, when I say effectively, it's uh, much better than primary hepatocytes. So we have the same uh, metabolic capacity as the liver in the body, uh, which is actually was all the, the the goal of our entire design. So that's why after two hours, we already see uh, this this kind of effect. Great. Um, and anyone, if you have any other questions, uh, make sure you reach out to me. Uh, I'll, I'll leave my email in the chat and I can get you in contact with any of the presenters that you need. Uh, I think that is it. So I appreciate every, every one of the presenters. Thank you guys so much for presenting. It was an extremely informative event and uh if anyone is just stopping by or only caught part of the present uh, presentation from max or from vincent or from anyone and wants to catch the entire thing all over again i will be posting this to bioservices website uh, and i'll make sure i trim it up and uh put different uh, narrative points in there so you guys can catch the part that you uh, want to specifically look at so thank you to all the presenters and thank you to everyone that has stopped by bye guys thank you thank you bye